Hey guys, what's up? I want to go over Revelation a little bit more again. I haven't done this for a while, so I want to get back into it. But this is on kjvforum.com. If you come here on your desktop, you'll see the menu at the top. You go to study, go to study by book, go to Revelation, and then it'll have all the chapters in Revelation. Um, and they're not all finished yet. Okay, none of them are really finished, but... Uh, a lot of them, especially the later chapters, don't have anything yet, any commentary, but it's just the the chapters of Revelation are there. So I was going to go over Revelation 14. I went over this this morning a little bit. And for those of you who don't know, I believe in an idealist view of Revelation. I mean, that's that's how it is, actually. You know, Revelation's like a big allegory. I think it's comprehensive, like throughout the ages, pretty much. Um, so I don't believe in a futurist view that, you know, what's popularly taught, the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist, the rapture, and all that is not taught in Revelation or Scripture. And I don't believe in a preterist view that all this stuff happened in 70 AD. I believe in an idealist view. So anyways, I just went over and made some comments on, on each verse, almost each verse. There's some that are without comments, but... I'm going to go over this, and I've said before that I want to finish, go through Revelation like this, get kind of a comment on each verse, point out some things, and then go over it again and over it again until I get to like a final expository. So this is just kind of like a brief overview, just going over some things that I've learned today or went over. Revelation chapter 14 verse 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And so it's it's basically God's name is written in their foreheads in this hundred and forty-four thousand. In contrast to the mark of the beast, it signifies their allegiance to God. And so it's very interesting that it says their, the, the father's name is written in their foreheads, because a lot of people make a big deal out of the mark of the beast. They have this futurist point of view. They think that the mark is going to be some microchip or something because it says that, you know, nobody could buy or sell without having it. But this whole revelation, it's all an allegory. It's all symbolical. And so, you know, if it's supposed to be some kind of microchip that comes in the future or something, why isn't the Father's name that's written in the forehead some kind of a mi microchip that saints would receive or something, you know, they completely ignore this, basically. They'll say, well, this is symbolic, but the mark of the beast, it has to be physical and literal or something. But no, it's not. So it's kind of hard to explain right now for me to express in words what Revelation teaches, but I'm working more and more towards that. I want to perfect this because I want to understand it better, and I want to be able to explain it better. But it's a process, and so I'm just going to go over little things here and there that, that I think or or helpful or maybe bring a new perspective to it. Okay. Obviously, you know, we know the lamb is Jesus Christ and uh so this is symbolic, you know, it, it's not a literal lamb. You know, a lamb stood on Mount Sion, so it's not a literal lamb standing in Jerusalem or something. Okay. Well, what about Mount Sion? Uh an interesting thing is uh there's so much just in this one verse. It's like, you know, what about the Lamb? What about Mount Sion? What about the 144,000? What about the name that's written in their foreheads? <sighs> okay, so one thing I was reading, which I'm, I'm trying to wonder, is the 144,000 on earth, when this is being said, are they supposed to be on earth and the Lamb is in heaven? Later on we see, on the second verse, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, and the voice of the harpers harping with their harps. And so we see this is in heaven. This is from heaven. It's God speaking. Um, so what does this exactly mean, that he's on Mount Sion? Uh, you know, I would think that you know, it could just mean that, you know, he's the king um, and it's not, it's not a literal physical place on the earth, Mount Sion. Um, maybe it just symbolizes something, you know. It's not necessarily saying that it's a physical literal place on the earth or that it's a place in heaven, but maybe it's just more symbolism because he's standing 
on Mount Sion. So I don't know, you know, exactly how to explain this. The 144,000, you know, it talks about earlier, I think in Revelation 11, maybe where, well, I don't know if it's 10 or 11. I don't know. It's before 12. But it talks about them being from each of these different tribes. And uh, some of those tribes are supposed to be like no more. And so there's a lot of controversy over that. But generally my understanding is that 144,000 represents all of the redeemed, all of the saints. Okay, Not that it's limited to 144,000, but it's a symbolic number. Just meaning that you know God knows each and every one that is saved. Um, and, and it's just a number of completeness to represent all the saints. But anyways, let's move on through this. We'll never get any further. So, Revelation 14, verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, a voice of many waters, and a voice of the great thunder, and I heard a voice of harpers harping with their harps. So, the voice from heaven of many waters, uh, great thunder. I think we, there's probably references in, a, in other scriptures to where that's said of God's voice. Uh, so, we'd, we'd, I think that we would take that God is speaking from this. And I think that the many waters, the great thunder, just signifies the power of God. And Revelation 14.3, they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, which the elders, and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. Okay. And so I put the harpers are in heaven and the 144,000 are on the earth. But, um... You know, what is the song? And I read in some notes, it could be, you know, the song of the redeemed. There was a song that Moses sung. And it could be kind of referencing to that. Um, but it's just the song that, that the redeemed know. And uh, only they can have full joy in, in singing the song. No man could learn that except for the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. And some people, and even maybe myself in the past, people who are futurists, when they read which were redeemed from the earth, they might think, well, this means they were raptured or something. But no, it just means that they were, they were saved, okay, because they trusted in Jesus Christ. Um, so, and from the earth doesn't mean that necessarily that they were removed from the earth or taken from the earth but they were saved out of the earth, okay? Um, in contrast to everybody else who is lost on the earth. Uh, which we kind of see a, a similarity in, in this next passage, Revelation 14.4. 4. These are they which were not def defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whither so, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So up here we say we see these which were redeemed from the earth. Here we see these which were redeemed from among men. So I think that the idea is just that they were they're saved. Okay. That's basically about it. Um from the earth just means that, you know, they they are they are men who are redeemed in contrast with men who are not redeemed. Now, the fact that they are virgins, they're, they're not defiled with women for they are virgins. This represents spiritual virginity. They have not committed the fornication of idolatry as all the nations have in verse 8, which we will see. You know, And people will say, well, it says they're not defiled with women or whatever, and they want to take this literally and, you know, like, like wooden, literally. Like, you have to understand, this is all vision, this is all allegory, this is all symbolic. And so, they're not defiled with women. It, they're virgins in a general sense. They haven't bowed down to other gods. Okay, they serve the one true God. And so, it's in that sense that they are pure and undefiled. And it mentions that they're the fr first fruits, 
that could mean that they are set apart as God's portion from the earth. Revelation 14, 5, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. Okay, this doesn't mean that they were sinless, but they're without fault because their sins have been confessed. Okay, and covered by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and, form, and people. And uh, so I put not a literal angel, but a symbol for a general concept. Um, so that might be kind of hard to understand. But anyways, I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation. And so I, I saw this in some notes and I just decided to put it on here, but it could mean that, you know, while John saw this vision, like this, this angel is a part of his vision, he didn't actually, it wasn't, I don't know. Anyways, there's a lot of controversy over the everlasting gospel part. Uh, it's preached to everyone. And I'll continue Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And so I think this is basically the gospel in its simplest, truest form. Uh, you know, stripped of everything, basically, you know, turn to God, there's a coming judgment, follow God. And kind of like we see in Acts 14, 15, and saying, Sirs, why do you do these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye sh tur should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and the earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Revelation 14, 8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, Babylon is another picture of the beast from the sea, the world system, which is in rebellion against God. And so we see, you know, a city or being spoken of. It says it's a city, and it says she. It's being referred to as a female. So there's just so much figurative language here. And she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So intoxication is a part of her seduction, and those who drink of her wine will drink of the... will drink. I need to change that. Will drink of the wine of the wrath of God in verse 10. We see Revelation verse 14, 9 and verse 10. And the, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive the mark in his forehead, his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, Revelation 14, 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And without mixture means with no mercy. Uh, all the full wrath of God poured onto the wicked uh, at the day of their judgment. And, you know, what was I thinking of? Oh, I read a good quote about the fire. Uh, and they said, you know, this is a good verse for proving eternal damnation, you know, eternal torment and punishment and hell, everlasting torment. But uh, somebody said that usually the reality is greater than the symbol. So if hell fire is not literal fire in hell, which it probably isn't, it's far worse. Okay, so fire... You know, everlasting burning is something that we can picture in our mind, that we can understand and think, you know, how horrible is that? But the reality is that hell 
is far worse than we could ever imagine. Okay, that's just about as close as we can get with our human limited knowledge and understanding. So that's really interesting. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And so this is the incentive for the patience of the saints in verse 12, which is the next verse, Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And so... And I read that this might not be speaking of martyrdom. It just simply says, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. But martyrdom is a common theme throughout Revelation. So, you know, it's not unlikely or unplausible to take that understanding that this is speaking of monar martyrdom. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Okay, now we're going to get into a third picture of final judgment. Okay, which I'm not sure exactly what the first two are, but I need to look over that. But anyways, I'm just going to take this as it is. And so this, this picture is comprehensive, including the whole process of the winding up of the ages. So I've said this before, and, and I do believe this is true. And it, it trips up, it gets us tripped up. And uh, basically, like when Jesus said in Matthew 25, I think, you know, the sheep and goat judgment, that parable. And he's basically, you know, like all the sheep will be gathered and all the goats will be gathered or, you know, the tares and the wheat. And so we get this picture of this final judgment where like everybody's judged at once, the righteous and the wicked. But that's not so. Okay. Hebrews says that it's appointed to men once to die and then the judgment. So we're each judged individually. Okay. The wicked and the righteous. When our body dies, that's when we're judged, okay? The righteous go to be with the Lord, and the um, wicked go to everlasting punishment. And so that's how it is. But in this book, Revelation, and these parables, you know, these figurative, symbolic, allegorical passages, it's kind of like a, it's just a, it's just a view saying that, you know, the righteous are going to be judged and the wicked are going to be judged and each are going to go where they belong. And it's kind of just like an overall comprehensive thing. Okay. So Revelation 14:14, 14, 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one that sat like unto the Son of Man, having his head having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And so there's a lot that's symbolic in here that I could probably go over, you know, the white cloud and the golden crown. You know, he's the king, he's the ruler, he's uh, omnipotent, he is sovereign. You know, in his hand is a sharp sickle. So the sickle, you know, is symbolic, the crown symbolic, the cloud symbolic, it's all symbolic. So many things to dissect in Revelation. Revelation 14, 15, and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so an angel came out of the temple. And so the temple is symbolic of the presence of God. Now, uh, now an interesting thing I read too is that uh, in verse fourteen fourteen it says one sat on a white cloud like unto the Son of Man. Okay, and so and he had a crown on his head. So we think you know this is the Lamb, this is Jesus Christ. And then in verse fourteen it says an angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust thy sickle and reap. For the time has come. And and it's like, okay, wait a minute. What's an angel doing giving commandments or orders to Jesus? Like, it should be the other way around. Um, but they said, uh, the comments was pretty interesting. They said in, like, Revelation 24, Jesus said, to me, it, the time is not is not known, okay? So the Father knows the time when men will be judged. And... Uh, 
I guess this could be representative of, you know, the angel speaking to the son the from the father, I guess. So that's interesting. Revelation 14, verse 16, And he that sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And so a lot think that this is speaking of the righteous. The righteous taken first. Revelation 14, 17, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So they think that this is speaking of the wicked. And we'll see in Revelation 14:19, And the angel thrust in a sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So the vine of the earth represents uh, the multitude of the wicked, and the grapes are the individual wicked persons and so they're cast into the great wine press of the wrath of god again all symbolic we're not talking about grapes we're not talking about wine presses so uh, and these are things that a lot of people can obviously say yeah that's obviously symbolic but then there gets down to things that it seems harder to accept as symbolic um you know, like I read earlier about the lamb sitting on Mount Sion. So it's a Mount Sion. Somebody might want to make that like a literal physical place or the fact that they're virgins and, and haven't uh, defiled themselves with women. You know, they might want to think they're these are physical, literal virgins or something. They don't want to see it as symbolic or spiritual. Um, and, you know, the angel coming out of the temple. Maybe they want to think that it's a physical, literal temple, but, you know, very much of it is symbolic. In Revelation 14:20, the last verse, and the wine press was trodden without the city, and become and blood came out of the wine press even to the horses' br bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And so, without the city means that they were excluded from the presence of the righteous. And there's a lot of different views on the space of a thousand and six furlongs, but some people think it's kind of just like the um, the measurements of the earth or something, meaning that the righteous can't es or the wicked can't escape the wrath of God. Um, there's nowhere that they can go um, to escape His wrath, basically. So yeah, hopefully this wasn't confusing to you guys, but. Probably was, but just some things for you to think about. So, thanks, and hopefully there'll be more soon. God bless.